Morgan smartly doesn't stay around to go chasing Tarleton. He immediately begins to move back towards North Carolina. Green moves back to North Carolina. They meet up at Guilford Courthouse, but they don't fight a battle there at this time. They meet up, and their plan is to move across North Carolina as rapidly as they can to get to the other side of the Dan River, and there get re new recruits and uh, maybe go on the counteroffensive. And that is exactly what they did. Cornwallis was never able to get local intelligence to find out what the enemy was doing. After Cowpens, nobody was going to tell the Brits anything. And the race to the Dan, like Valley Forge, it is one of those remarkable examples of American soldiers' courage. We know how pitifully clothed that the men at Valley Forge were. But this is the way Green, in a letter to Washington, described the condition of his men as they were marching sometimes 20, 30 miles a day through snow and ice. This is in the winter of 1781. The most miserable situation of the troops has rendered the march the most painful and imaginable. Several hundred of the soldiers marking the ground with their bloody feet. They didn't have shoes. But our army is in good spirits notwithstanding their sufferings and excessive fatigue. They crossed the Dan River a day ahead of Cornwallis, got reinforcements. Cornwallis turned around and went marching back into North Carolina toward Guilford Courthouse. Green followed, but now Cornwallis and his army were the hunted instead of the hunter. Green chose the battle next, the battle site at Guilford Courthouse. His plan was similar to that to Morgan's at Cowpens, but unfortunately didn't work out quite as well as Cowpens. Statistically, it might be called a draw. Technical military historians say it was a British victory because they maintained the field when the day was over. But at a certain point, excuse me, Green sensibly withdrew his men from the field because his purpose was to save his army, not to occupy the territory. But the battle lasted an hour and a half, but it was a costly victory for Cornwallis. He lost one fourth of his army, killed, wounded, prisoners. In London, a member of parliament described it as a Pyrrhic victory after, King, after the classical victory, or, you know, another such victory and we are undone. In the space of two months between Cowpens and Guilford Courthouse, Cornwallis's effectives had been reduced by more than 50%. By the t after Guilford Courthouse, he only has 1,400 effectives. It's a beaten army. And in his biographer's words, Guilford Courthouse was a victory, but so dearly bought that Cornwallis would never resume the offensive again in the Carolinas and he began to retreat to Wilmington, North Carolina on the coast where he hoped he could be resupplied. But that retreat took three weeks. And Cornwallis wrote to a colleague, I assure you that I am quite tired of marching about the countryside in search of adventures. However, he had a plan for victory. He said, let's take on Virginia. He was writing, we'll get those troops from New York and I'll march into Virginia and then the revolution will be one. He didn't leave North Carolina immediately. He wanted to make sure that South Carolina was secure. And the British did defeat Nathaniel Green at the Battle of Hobkirk Hill, which is near Camden. But again, this was one of those close things. It was a draw. At a certain point, Green decides, I'm going to keep my army and I'm going to, I'm going to move back. The British won Hobkirk Hill, but they had to abandon Camden. So, I mean, it's and this is, begins to happen all over uh, South Carolina. So thinking South Carolina's safe, he begins the march uh, to Virginia. And then, as his biographers note, on the 13th of May, 1781, Cornwallis crossed his Rubicon, the Roanoke River. Virginia in 1781 is interesting prior to the Battle of Yorktown. American forces are under the command of a young Frenchman, nobleman, the Marquis de Lafayette. Uh, 
he has a small army keeping an eye on British forces commanded by American traitor Benedict Arnold. And once Cornwallis gets there, joins up with Arnold, um, they sort of have a cat and mouse game between Lafayette and, and Cornwallis across the state. Now one of the reasons that Lafayette was able to be so successful, he was a very able young man, but he had a spy in Cornwallis's camp. He had a servant, a person of color, who was placed in Cornwallis's personal retinue, and he had the name James Lafayette. That should, might have given somebody a clue. <laughs> but literally, James Lafayette was feeding information on almost a daily basis to uh, Lafayette. In New York, Sir Henry Clinton directed Cornwallis to establish a defended post at an anchorage where British warships could come in in terms of, of support. And he said, choose either Old Point Comfort or Yorktown on the James, uh, uh, the Old Point Comfort was on the, was on the James. Cornwallis's military engineers decided that Old Point Comfort wasn't good and Yorktown was the answer. And that's where Cornwallis established his camp where eventually um, his biographers couldn't say he met his Waterloo, but that is exactly what happened. And so I now have Cornwallis to Yorktown, and the Cincinnati has another lecturer who's going to tell you about the campaign at Yorktown. Okay.